I'm calling this part of our lecture Nuisances and City Living. What is a nuisance? A nuisance is defined under English common law as something that prevents you from enjoying your property. So let's say you have a nice backyard and you're enjoying your property and your neighbor decides to dig a coal mine in his backyard. The dust that came about because of the earth moving would be a nuisance. The coal dust that drifts into your backyard once the mine is in operation is a nuisance. The noise and the smell is a nuisance. And under English common law, which of course was adopted in the United States, but under English common law, being exposed to such a nuisance entitled you to injunctive relief. The law of nuisances is an important cornerstone, an important part of the foundation of modern environmental law. And we're talking about city living, of course, because after the Civil War, the United States became a nation of towns and cities. Most of the new immigrants were settling in the cities. Most of the economic activity was in the cities. In 1860, the year before the Civil War, the value of America's agricultural exports exceeded that of the industrial exports for the last time. America, or the United States, had become a land of cities, and there were plenty of nuisances in the cities. This is a photograph from Jacob Riss's seminal 1890 book, How the Other Half Lived, in which this crusading photojournalist exposed the horrible living conditions in the overcrowded tenements of New York City, and most other cities were not much different. Here we see three young boys sleeping on a stairwell. There is a barrel, probably that contained coal ash tipped over. There's uh, bits of uh, wood, bits of paper, what look like chicken bones here. And these boys are exposed to the dust. They're exposed to the dirt. They are exposed to the inhalation hazards of the ash. This is a typical city street or a typical city alleyway. You can see it's covered in trash. The housing stock is pretty substandard. Uh, you don't see it in this picture, but we can be pretty confident that the sanitary facilities are primitive at best. And of course, the population density is going to be huge. And a huge population density like that generated a lot of garbage, which was loaded onto these garbage scows, towed offshore, you can see a little tugboat here, towed offshore, and New York City's garbage was dumped into the Atlantic Ocean. The garbage would frequently wash back onto the beaches in places like the Jersey Shore, Coney Island, Manhattan Beach, and in those hot summer months, vacationers at the beaches were scurrying back into their hotels to escape the horrendous smells. The U.S. Navy was even worried that New York City was dumping so much garbage into the ocean that before long its harbor was not going to be usable. So New York City was forced to adopt the first citywide recycling program. For the first time in the city's history, things like glass, paper, metal, manure, and food waste were all collected and recycled. And a big part of that recycling effort were these men, the White Wings, the New York City street sweepers. And these were organized as a uniform service in the mid-1890s. The White Wings did something truly amazing, because for the first time in history, Every street in every neighborhood of New York City was cleaned and swept. Before that, if you were rich, you could always hire someone to street, uh, clean the streets but in your neighborhood. You could hire a maid to keep your front porch and your sidewalk clean. But now, for the first time in history, the entire city was cleaned up. It was a dramatic public health and public sanitation move forward. The White Wings wore a white uniform to symbolize cleanliness, and they wore a policeman's helmet to symbolize the city's authority. Now, I don't want you to think that rural America, the rural United States, was a uh, 
uh, place with the, everything was clean and pure from the same time period. This is a famous engraving called Sewing Diphtheria. Here, a housewife is pouring contaminated water right outside her front door. It's going to seep down into the ground and recontaminate the family drinking water well. Here's a gentleman who has put a little trough next to his well. He's pumping his water down into maybe his cesspool or his uh, septic container, flushing it out, flushing the sewage back onto, his, onto the ground where it's going to sink right back down into the groundwater. Here we have a man sleeping on a tropical beach in a hammock under a full moon. Sounds very nice. I think we'd like to spend our vacations that way. And we here we have two Arctic explorers sleeping in the cold northern waste under the moon. And both of these are pictures. These men have adequate ventilation. But what about this poor person living in the rural United States? They have the window closed, and the soot and the smoke from the oil lamp is escaping into the room air, and the uh, pot-bellied stove here is contributing its own indoor air pollution. So not everyone had completely internalized the idea that good health and good sanitation went hand in hand. And that was very apparent at this place. This is Jamaica Bay, New York, where much of New York City's oyster business was centered. Millions of pounds of oysters were harvested out of Jamaica Bay, which is in the, in, in the, within the borders of New York City. Half of the bay is in Brooklyn, and the other half is in Queens. It's on the south shore of Long Island, a very productive coastal ecosystem, but one that was increasingly being subjected to assaults from sewage. Here's a little oyster skiff. The men would go out and harvest the oysters and bring them back to the oyster houses built along the shore of the bay. Underneath the oyster houses was a big wooden tank called um, where a box where the oysters were going to be floated. Now what that means is you take this tank, which is in the bay, it's made out of wood, so it does... Uh, exchange water with the bay, and fresh water would flow into the tank. Now, when the oysters encountered the fresh water, they would grow plumper, and they would be able to get, you'd be able to get a higher price for your oysters. Unfortunately, right next to the oyster house, where the oysters are being stored, in the tidal creek is a three-hole outhouse. And this outhouse, the human waste, is draining right into the creek. There were a number of typhoid outbreaks, some quite far inland, that were directly traced to specific oyster houses that were exposed to streams of human waste from nearby privies. All oystering in Jamaica Bay came to an end in 1924 when it was no longer legal to harvest oysters for human consumption from Jamaica Bay. But if you were living in the late 1800s, early 1900s in an American city, perhaps the biggest nuisance which you were exposed to was that of smoke. Here you see factory smokestacks spewing out coal smoke. Coal smoke, there were no uh, pollution control devices at that time. The coal smoke contained huge amounts of uh, sulfur oxides and nitrous oxides which are which when they hit water form sulfuric acid and nitric acid so if you hung your wet laundry on the clothesline to dry the sulfur oxides would come in contact with your laundry would dissolve into the water that was drying from your laundry form sulfuric acid and cause your clothing to disintegrate right on the clothesline. This is Grand Central Station in New York City before the tracks were electrified and buried underground. Here we see one, two, three, at least three or four steam locomotives spewing out smoke. Smoke abatement. 
was one of the first environmental laws passed in many large cities. You couldn't have steam locomotives operating on city streets because of the smoke problem. For this reason, steam locomotives were banned from lower Manhattan, the tracks were electrified and buried under what is today 6th Avenue. And if you were looking south on 6th Avenue today, Grand Central Station would be here, and the Pan Am building or the MetLife building would be about here. This was one of the first times that a law was enacted that addressed a specific environmental problem in a large city. Another environmental problem in the large city was water pollution. This is the silk dyeing in Patterson, New Jersey. This photograph dates to about 1915, and the wastewater from these silk dyeing vats were going to be discharged directly into the Passaic River. The silk dyers had a pipe called the dyer's pipe, and this was a fresh water supply, a dedicated fresh water supply that brought fresh water from the upper Passaic River into the dye houses because water from the lower Passaic River around Patterson was no longer clean enough for silk dyeing operations. Of course, thanks to Dr. John Snow and Louis Pasteur and others, we knew that clean water and good health went hand in hand. So at this time, the late 1800s, 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, up until the 1920s, we begin to see the construction of major drinking water reservoirs in the Upper Passaic River watershed. This is the Wanakee Reservoir, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. We also see the construction of trunk line sewers that brought wastewater out from the local rivers, out of the local creeks, and into New York Harbor or out into the ocean. This was a dramatic public health measure that cleaned up a lot of the local rivers. Of course, the rivers didn't get completely cleaned up. This is a dredging operation of the Passaic River uh, in Lindhurst to remove dioxin-contaminated sediments, but we'll talk more about that later in the semester. Before we close, it's very important to talk about the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899. It is unlawful to throw, discharge, deposit, or cause to suffer thrown, discharge, or deposited from ship barges or floating craft or from a wharf, a manufacturing establishment, refuse matter of any kind or description, other than flowing from the streets and sewers, passing in a liquid state. You could not throw solid refuse into navigable water or the tributaries of navigable water. This law was passed because we had a lot of waterways that looked like this. This is the Gowanus Canal in Brooklyn, New York, and you can see the banks of the Gowanus Canal are lined with factories. This is the manufactured gas plant. Uh, this looks like a coal yard. This is a cement plant. And if you had a factory along a canal like this or a waterway like this and you had a waste product, what did you do with it? You dumped it in. But after the River and Harbor Act of 1899, you couldn't do that anymore. We're going to come back to that act later on in the semester when we talk about the Clean Water Act because this was another fundamental building block of modern environmental law.